Hi, my name's Matt. I'm one of the trainers for Circle Pause. I'm also a bookseller, and I've operated and managed bookstores for the last 15 years. In this series of videos, we've been working our way through the training process. In this training session, we'll be covering the following. Account sales, lay by, stock transfer between stores, accounts receivable and statements, all the reporting functions, wish loops, micro-marketing, loyalty and promotions, and going through our returns process. The first thing we'll be covering is account sales. This is the process in which you would produce an invoice for a school or a business through the POS where you would accept payment at a later time. To begin an account sale, we now search for the customer the same way we would any other, either by pressing Control N or by pressing the button next to Name in POS. We search for the customer the same way that we always would, either by name or by phone number. Once the customer has been loaded into POS, we can clearly see any notes for this customer and the discount which will be applied to their transactions. Instead of doing a normal cash sale, we're gonna choose account sale at the top of the screen here. We can notice that the screen slightly changes. It now displays the credit limit amount for this particular customer it also has a box down the bottom for customer reference and for any notes that we might have to put through with this transaction. From here, we would simply start scanning items as we normally would. We can see that the automatic discount has been applied here. As it's going to be an account sale, we may be required to put in some customer reference information, perhaps a purchase order number. As we'll be invoicing these items, we're not going to be required to accept any form of payment here. We simply go down to the amount and press spacebar to finalize the transaction. To quickly print off a copy of the invoice to go with the goods, we can press the last invoice button in the POS or press Control P. This will automatically open up a new tab in our browser with a printable version of the invoice displayed. While not as common as it used to be, CirclePOS still includes the function of laybys and allows you to create and manage your laybys. Much like customer orders, there is a correct way to do this process. To create a layby, the first thing we do is look the customer up in the pods. If the customer is not found in your database, you will need to manually add them. Once you've successfully added the customer to the pods, we now scan the items like we normally would. From here, we can choose layby as the option. Much like an account sale, we can see that the pods slightly changes. Unlike an account sale, we will be accepting some form of payment. In this transaction, I'm accepting a $10 deposit on this layby. To finalize the transaction, I simply press spacebar or press the post button. This will generate a layby receipt be handed over to the customer. Stock transfer is a common practice amongst group stores. First, we'll be taking a look at transferring the goods from store one and then we'll take a look at the process of receiving those goods when they arrive at store two. Transferring stock between stores within a group is straightforward. The first thing we do is look the store that we wish to transfer to up within the POS. I will be transferring this to our second store here. We now choose account sale and scan the items as normal. We don't need to change any prices or discount. We simply go over to the amount box, click in it, and post this transaction. Once the goods have arrived at our second store, we go into Inwards Goods, Jobs, and find the transfer that's come from the first store. We select it, confirm that we have all of the books that are listed here. We may need to print labels at this point. And once we've done that, we simply tick this box for purchase order, which has come from the first store and load stock and fill orders. This will complete the transfer. Once we have successfully invoiced goods through the POS, we can now use accounts receivable to keep track of those invoices and generate statements if they are required. Once we've successfully created invoices, we can keep track of all that information under accounts age receivable. In age receivable, we can search for customers, clicking on the customer that we're interested in looking up, and display outstanding invoices within this time frame. Under age receivables, we can display outstanding invoices, clearly seeing the overdue days. If required, we can generate statements from here as well, simply by ticking this box here 
and either printing a statement or emailing it directly to the customer. We can also go straight to our sales invoices and also see our pending sales invoices. CirclePos offers in-depth and thorough reporting. We'll now take a quick look through all of these reporting features and I'll highlight the ones that are most useful in day-to-day -day operations of a store. All of our reporting features are found under the reports tab in the back office. The first one is monthly sales. This is a great way for stores to see at a glance how they're tracking month to month, year to year. Anytime we see this icon, we can download this information into a CSV file. We can see the percentage difference of our own store. And while we don't share community sales history, we can also see the percentage change within the community. We can see our gross profit. And just below it, we also have some graphs to make things easier. The next report is sales this week. This is a great way for stores to see just how many customers are coming into the store and what their average items per sale is. Once again, we can see this icon if we do need to download anything. This is also a printable report. Sales by hour shows us a breakdown of our sales during our opening hours. This is handy if perhaps you are considering changing your opening hours of your business or perhaps deciding when to have more staff members present. The category report will display by default a 12 month period, but you can adjust that. And we can see our cost prices, sales, gross profit, and stock turnover for our particular categories. This can also be broken down into subcategories as well. This is also a printable report. Stock reporting is also broken down into categories and subcategories. It's particularly handy to keep track of your margins on non-book items. This is also a printable report. Under our stock reporting, we also have stock adjustments. And this is where we can find any manual adjustments to products within our inventory. We can see which user actually changed the stock level of this particular item and what they changed it to. This is also a printable report. The age stock report will show you items that have been in your store for over 12 months, 20, 12 to 24 months, 24 to 36 months, and 36 months and above. If your store doesn't do regular returns, this will be a handy report to look at. The item report. In the item report, we can get detailed sales history on particular items. Seeing the average we sell per week, our all-time sales, and what we've got on hand. This is useful if perhaps you are looking up an entire series or a particular group of books by an author. Our customer reports will show you straight away your top customers. These are the customers who spend the most amount of money with you. The time can be changed and also the purchase amount. We can check customers via category preference. That time frame can be changed. We can do the same with author preference. We can see everyone who has purchased books by this author. We have our lost customers list here. These are customers that have not purchased within a particular time frame. Uh, it's the reverse of your best customers essentially. And we can also search for customers via ISBN. Wishlists, micro marketing and promotions are all ways in which you can engage with your customers. We'll also take a look at the loyalty feature which is a great way to reward your regular customers. One of the great things your customers can do with your website is compile wish lists. Customer wish lists can be found under customer orders wish lists. There's two different types of wish lists. The first one is when a customer is simply compiling a wish list of items that they want. These wish lists can be publicly shared. So it may just be a customer putting together a list of items that they'd want at a future date. The second type of wish list is a contact requested one. And we can click on this tab here and find that information. These are items that are listed on your website that you did not have in stock when the customer was looking for it. They've opted to be notified when this product comes back into stock. When looking through this list, we can see if we've got a particular book on hand. If we wish to contact the customer, we simply tick the box on the right hand side and then click send email or SMS to customers. If you're opting to send an email, you simply press send email and the customer will receive one with all the product information linking directly back to their wish list. You also have the ability to send them an SMS if you would prefer. Using our customer reports, we can use micro marketing to target specific customers. So going to reports, customer, we may want to target our 
best customers for the last 12 months that have spent over $100 with us. From here, we can tick the left hand tick box for email and press email at the bottom. This will generate a list of all email addresses that are available. Using this list, you could target them directly via any mail service. We could do the reverse with lost customers, people who have not visited your store for over six months. By ticking this box, scrolling to the bottom, pressing email and generating this list, it gives us the ability to email those customers to let them know that the store is still there. We can generate these lists for category preference and author preference as well. If you wish to use the customer loyalty system, first you'll have to decide the amount in which you wish to give your customers. We can set that under settings, financial. Here we can choose to either enable or disable loyalty, decide the percentage in which we wanna give people, and also decide how long we would like that loyalty amount to stay valid for. We have the ability to generate promo codes for promotions on our website. Promotions has its own tab. From here, we can create our new promotion. We simply need to give it a name, a code in which we'll be giving to our customers, deciding whether we're going to give a percentage or a fixed amount, a date in which this promotion will start, and a date in which the promotion will end. We apply this to specific ISBNs. Once the promotion has been created and started, we can supply that promo code to our customers. Once the customer proceeds to checkout, they now have the ability to enter in the promo code. This will automatically apply the promo code to products that it's eligible for, but will not apply it to other products. The last thing that we'll cover in this video is our returns process, seeing how we handle not only sale or return items, but also damages and short supplies. So there's three types of returns that we'll be looking at. We'll go through these one at a time. The first one is a standard return, uh, would also be referred to as sale or return. All our returns are done through the returns tab in the back office, and we simply go to search. So I have chosen standard as the return type. I'm going to put a supplier in that I would like to return products to. I can also do this via category if I need to, if I want to specify which category I'd like to return. And I also have the ability here to change some of the filter parameters. So this would be um, the terms and conditions which you have agreed to with that particular supplier. At the moment, I'm just gonna leave this uh, unfiltered because I'd like to get as much information as possible on the screen. And I simply press search. This has now loaded up a list of products for this particular supplier, which are eligible for sale or return. I can see some basic ordering information here. I can see if I've returned any of these products already. I can also see the invoice date, the invoice number. I can see how many copies I have in stock at the moment. I can see how many days it's been since my last sale and how many days it's been since my first purchase. I can also see the total number of sales. The average days to sell is in this column here. And like elsewhere in circle, if I press this plus sign, I can get some more detailed sales history. At this point, I have to make a decision how many I would like to request I return to this particular supplier. Even though the products are displayed here, I may not choose to ask for a return. I can see that I have eight copies of this book in stock and I'd like to return all eight of them. If there have been no sales of a product, it will automatically add them in here, but you can choose to change that. Once I've confirmed how many products I'd like to return, I simply add them to my return cart. The return cart can be added to over a period of time, much like a purchase order cart. If I'm happy with the information in my return cart, I can choose to post it. If I need to put an internal reference here, I can do that as well. CirclePos will now generate a return authorization request with a list of all of the products, their invoice numbers, discounts, and cost prices. To send this through to the supplier, all we need to do is press confirm. From here, we'll be moved from search to cart 
to now awaiting approval. And we're waiting for a response from that supplier. Once the supplier has contacted us to approve our returns authorization, we click on our request number. Once again, we can see the products that we've added here to our request. We can remove some here if we need to, and we would put in our request authorization number given to us from our supplier and press post. We're now up to the processing part, and this is when the products leave our inventory. Once again, we click on our request number. We can see a list here of the products that the supplier has given us a return authorization for. We can choose to individually scan these items, or if you're confident that you have all of the products in front of you, you can choose to use the pick all option. These items have now been picked and they are ready to be returned to the supplier. We press post and we're moved over to the awaiting credit notes page. From here, we simply wait for a response from that particular supplier. And when we have received our credit, we once again click on the request number and enter in the credit note information. This completes our returns process. The next type of return we're gonna take a look at is our short supply. It's important when completing inwards goods that we receive in products that are on the invoice, even if they have been short supplied to us. This ensures that all of the invoice information is connected to that product. Once again, we go into returns, search. Our return type, we will choose short supply. And once again, enter in the supplier's information. From here, we would just enter in the ISBNs of the products that we have been short supplied and press search. This will list all of the times that product has come in from that supplier, but it's important to make sure that we are using the correct invoice number. Most of the time you'll find this is the newest invoice. We add to our return cart. We can see our return cart is set to short supply. It has the supplier's information and the product which we've been short supplied. We can put a reference in here if we need to, or we can simply press post. From here, it will generate a short supply credit claim. We can confirm that and send that directly off to the supplier. As this is the short supply, it will skip awaiting approval and returns to process and move us directly over to awaiting credit notes. We would wait for the response from the supplier, usually a credit note, click on the request number and enter in that information. Pressing submit will move us to completed. The last type of return that we would have would be a damage. This is when we've received something from the supplier and it's turned up to us damaged. We would go back into our returns process and search, setting our return type to damaged, entering in our supplier information and scanning the damaged product into our search. All of the supplier's information can be found here. We add to return cart. We can see that our cart is set to damaged. We can enter in an internal reference if we need to. We'll press post and generate a damaged goods authorization request. When we confirm this, it will be sent directly to the supplier. Much like a standard return, we now wait for an approval. When we receive one, we click on the request number, enter in our approval number from our supplier and press post. This moves us to returns to process. We click on our request number again, either individually scanning items and using the scan pick button or using the pick all button and posting them. We are now waiting for a credit note from our supplier. And when we receive one, we click on our request number again, entering in the credit note information and pressing submit, moving us over to completed. That completes training session four. We've covered account sales, lay by, stock transfer, accounts receivable and statements, all reporting functions, wish lists, micro marketing, loyalty and promotions, and have a look at our returns process. Additional training sessions can be booked with one of our trainers at the links below.